For those of you that aren't familiar with Paul, he's, a, he's an award-winning photojournalist, uh, has received the Pulitzer Prize, and uh, he was actually involved with the expedition um, that discovered the, uh, that discovered the Erebus this past summer, and so the content of his presentation will have to do with that. Uh, his title, the title for his presentation is Finding Erebus, the True Story Behind the Discovery of Sir John, Cl Sir John Franklin's Flagship. And um, he, uh, his time on, in Joa Haven in, uh, on King w William's Island involved uh, extensive interviews um, to do with the oral history um, and the traditions around uh, Franklin's um, disappearance and where that may have happened. And so we'll be, uh, be hearing more about that. And so I will now introduce to you Paul Watson. Please give him a warm welcome. Quoting uh, salvers, the experts at finding shipwrecks for their profit or other purposes, UNESCO says there are some three million undiscovered shipwrecks on our planet. And that number alone makes you wonder why two ships, HMS Erebus and HMS Terror, have captivated the imagination for so many generations. The experts tell me there's no treasure on it. There's no gold unless, as one said to me, it's in the teeth of Sir John himself because some people believe that through listening to Inuit testimony and other reasons that perhaps his skeleton is on one of those wrecks. There's no monetary reason to be captivated by it. So I ask myself, why are so many people around the world, and believe me, when, when you work in the business of newspapers, you find out how many people are interested in this story still. Why are they so captivated today? I settle on the partial answer of, it's a mystery. Everyone loves a mystery. Plus, it's the far north. It's a story of endurance, of exploration, in a place that even today, few people are able to visit. I had the, the great honor and privilege of being on a CCGS or Wilfrid Laurier, the main vessel, it's a Coast Guard icebreaker. It was the lead vessel in the search operation this past summer, which you all know was successful in finding Erebus. My bunkmate was the head of under, uh, underwater archaeology in this country, which is a Parks Canada department, uh, a man named Marc-Andre Bernier. And I saw him when he came back uh, after having made visual confirmation that this was one of Franklin's two vessels. And he began to tell me, because I had been kept out of the loop, this had to be top secret for various reasons. They had found it some days earlier but having confirmed it, he was packing quickly to fly to Ottawa for a news conference with the Prime Minister to tell the world. As he was packing, he started to tell me quickly the story of how this unfolded, which is the story that I'm about to tell you. And he began to cry because the years of the pressure that had built up, you can imagine, especially during that period of recession that came just before this, there was an enormous pressure, a lot of people questioning why are you spending so much money on this, others uh, who are experts, perhaps, perhaps some among us today, who were saying you're looking in the wrong places, you're using the wrong equipment. When they finally found it, there was an outpouring of emotion on this team of underwater archaeologists, we have finally done something that literally if you cost it in today's dollars, is in the tens of millions of dollars. There are dozens of searches dating back to the mid-19th century. Uh, poor Lady Franklin, Sir John Franklin's widow, uh, close to bankrupted herself, funding private searches. If you cost all of those dollars in today's dollars, it's easily in the tens of millions of dollars. You can imagine all of that coming to mind in poor Marc Andre Bernier's head. We have finally succeeded where so many others failed. Now, 
People will tell you, and I saw reports that suggested this, that this is a story about the triumph of technology. Um, in my opinion, and I've asked others, they agree with me, not really. Because the technology that was used to finally actually put eyes on the ship is pretty old sonar technology. It's not all that fancy. It's an object not so big that's pulled behind a boat and it sends out a sonar signal and there she is. What really happened is what's true with so many great human endeavors. It was the hard work of many people over several generations. It was some good luck and I think I feel safe saying this among people who spend time in the wilderness. I believe it had something even more to do with, with what I will call serendipitous moments, what Carl Jung called synchronicity or meaningful coincidences, what others will call spirits. There, there are moments in this story, as, as you're about to hear, and I am, I'm only going to touch on, on, on a few. My excuse is I don't have a lot of uh, time to give you all of it, but the truth is I'm writing a book about it, and I haven't finished interviewing people yet. And I'm only a little bit down this road, which started when Marc-Andre Bernier said to me in that same cabin on that same day, it's as if she wanted us to find her. And that set off a switch in my mind, and I thought, well, what an intriguing notion. And I set out to start talking to people, and it became obvious to me that each one of the people I've spoken to so far has a moment where if that hadn't happened, the ball wouldn't have moved forward, and the search would have stopped, and we wouldn't know what we know today. And, uh, you know, final teaser, the experts are extraordinarily excited about what they have seen so far. And these are not people who normally get excited, um, uh, you know, at least not publicly. So I'm fairly confident in saying we are going to hear a lot of very interesting things as they explore Erebus, and almost certainly they're going to find terror. We're going to hear some more exciting things from that one. This story is going to unfold for years to come, and it's going to become quite gripping. I'm going to start the story in 1964 with a man named Walter Zakarczuk. Uh, I went to interview him in Ottawa. Um, he, you know, the, the, the whole profession of underwater or marine archaeology, I didn't know this until some months ago, it's not all that old. It only dates back to the 1960s. Uh, someone famously said at the time, before the profession was born, the, the method that was used was archaeologists, trained professionals, would be on the deck of a ship and they'd send, they would brief a diver or divers on what to do when they got down there and then they'd hope that they did the right thing for them. And famously, an archaeologist said at the time, it would be easier to train an archaeologist to dive than it is to train a diver to be an archaeologist. Well, from that, in early 1960s to today, the Parks Canada underwater archaeology team is among the best in the world. Canada leads in this profession um, in a way that, that I, I don't think our public fully understands. Even to the point of internationally um, you know, lobbying other countries to adopt what is a fairly new philosophy, which is that artifacts should be left where they lie on ships. And Canada has been central uh, in, in leading that effort. Walter Zakarchuk was born in the Ukraine. His parents were anti-Bolshevik. They were expelled from Ukraine to Poland just before the Nazis invaded. The Nazis took Walter as a child away from his parents, put him in a factory as a slave laborer. He nearly starved to death. His job was to take little glass vials out of a gas-fired machine which were used to store medicine for Hitler's army. He joked to me, you know, I should have a PhD in grade one. He's, 
he had to go to grade one seven times because throughout his life as a child, he was constantly being moved. He would get to one place, a crisis would happen, he'd get to another, and on down the road. In one of these moves, he found himself by the sea in France and saw a diver, a couple of divers, come out of the water. And he was enchanted by what he saw and said, ran up to them and asked to borrow their mask and they let him. And he looked in the water and he just knew at that moment, this is what I have to do with my life. He ends up in Canada and he doesn't, his, his, you know, the family doesn't have a lot of money, he has very little education, but he wants to be a diver. So he makes his own diving equipment with a broom handle, some garden hose. His wife would stand on the dock, he told me, and pump this thing with a, with a homemade pump he made of, out of an apple juice tin. And he would walk along the, the bottom and try to breathe and it didn't work. So he, he you know, s s he discovers uh, scuba um, in a store in Montreal and thinks, well, that's what I've got to make. So he, he gets a, a fire extinguisher, drains it, and tries to figure out how to get air into the fire extinguisher and then build a makeshift regulator. And the problem is no one will fill up his fire extinguisher because he goes to place to place and they said, if we put air under pressure in that thing, it's going to explode. So he ends up at Air Liquide in Montreal, and the person at the desk says, you know, I, I don't really know the answer to your question, but let me find somebody who does. And calls an engineer out of the back, and I have to make sure I get his name right, Emile Gagnon, who, as it turns out, was the partner with Jacques Cousteau in inventing the Aqualon. Now, what are the chances of that? Um, you know, serendipitous moment number one. So he looks at it and he says, well, here's what you need. Go to the hospital, get this bit, get that bit, little bits that people would use, uh, you know, like a mouthpiece that was used for people with epilepsy, etc. Attach all those things, bring it back, and I'll fill it up. Sure enough, he had his first scuba equipment. He ends up, serendipitous moment number two, um, gathering artifacts underwater, uh, near an excavation site, this is 1964, where the head of Parks Canada Archaeology is doing work on land. And these, he, um, Walt Zakarchuk and his partner come out of the water with large numbers of excellent artifacts. And the head of Parks Canada Archaeology is astounded at these, these things that they're bringing up. And at that moment, he thought, we need to have an underwater archaeology team. Uh, the, the man's name was, was John H. Rick, Ricks, I think, Rick. Um, and he said, Walter, do you want to be my underwater archaeologist? That was the beginning in 1964 of Canada's underwater archaeology unit. Now that unit is the one that led the effort that found Erebus. So you can imagine in just those 50 years with that sort of odd beginning, um, all the things that had to go right to get to success. 1967, um, it, centennial year, the military thought, we need a really good centennial project, so let's go find Franklin ships. They took a team of, they took some soldiers who walked overland looking for artifacts along the shoreline. They took some army divers who had uh, wetsuits that are, you know, uh, I don't have to explain wetsuits to this audience. The, the water goes in and it's trapped there and your body warms it up. Well, in Arctic water, um, it doesn't work so well. <laughs> and it works even less well because I, Corporal Bob Shaw, who I just interviewed on the coast, told me the, the only way they could do it was to pull them by rope behind a zodiac. So you imagine being pulled in a wetsuit in the Arctic behind a zodiac, the water tends to go into the suit and your booties will balloon up. So he said they had to cut holes in the toes of the booties so they didn't balloon up. So the water is just flowing through the suit. So it doesn't have a moment to warm up. 
He said they're at about 30 to 50 feet below the surface, and you'd go as long as your air supply would last, about 40 minutes. And they had a wooden board with two holes cut in the, on the sides and the rope, and you tilt the board to the right, you go right. You tilt the board to the left, you go left, up and down. And they pulled them slowly at a few knots, and their job was to stare at the seabed and look for Erebus or terror. And he said all he remembers seeing is a tin can with a fish swimming out of it. And I said, well, couldn't that have been one of, uh, one of their provisions? And he said, no, I don't think so. And the only other thing he remembers seeing was the crystals of ice forming in the water as he was being pulled through. <laughs> um, you know, there's a longer story to it, but uh, uh, please buy the book, it'll, it'll be in there. Um, Martin Bergman, uh, you know, the, I'm sure he's well known in an audience like this. Um, he is an extraordinary Canadian who, um, he was a civil servant. His title was head of the Polar Continental Shelf Program, which is a fancy uh, name for what, what is a logistics center in Resolute in the, in the Arctic. The, it's a fascinating place to visit because scientists in the top of their fields from around the world, the climate change scientists, biologists, others who are doing research in the high Arctic end up there so you can get a free education just having lunch and, and listening to people speak. Um, the, the program was in a bit of trouble. It, they wanted, the government wanted it to be world class and it wasn't quite there because the demand was so intense they wanted it to be the best it could so they brought in Martin Bergman to make it um, that good. Uh, Martin Bergman was a special person because he made it his business to try to reach out to key players, diplomats, politicians, journalists, others, because he wanted to form a core group of people who would really get the at attention that the Arctic deserves and develop it in a way that he thought would be proper. So that was sort of his, his plot, if I could use that word. He didn't do it alone. He worked with a guy named Eddie Carmack. Um, Along the way, Martin Berkman becomes important for a whole number of reasons, but in, in terms of this discussion, he, he meets um, Jim Balsillie, who is the co-founder of RIM, the maker of BlackBerry. And, you know, as I said, Martin Bergman liked to f find the people he needed to make his mission work, and Balsillie was a perfect one. Um, the... They became friends. They went up to the Arctic a few summers. Uh, come August 2011, um, Marty phones Jim and says, Jim, you've got to come with me. We're going to have a great trip. Uh, pack your bags. This is going to be great. And they had just been up a few weeks earlier. And he, he said, look, I can't come this trip. I've got some trouble at the office. <laughs> um, we all know how that ended up. And Marty, you know, cajoled and begged and, and he just said, no, I can't do it this time, Marty. Well, August 20th, 2011, uh, first air aircraft on landing at Resolute uh, crashes. M Martin Bergman, a great Canadian, dies. Had Jim Balsillie said yes, um, quite probably, there were survivors from that, that crash, but quite probably Jim Balsillie would not be with us either. So on the turn of that yes or no moment, um, Jim Balsillie is still with us. Now he's a key player in this search because he chairs all of the meetings of the multi-agency search effort. So the Navy's there, Parks Canada's there, the Canadian Hydrographic Service is there, etc. The chair of those meetings is Jim Balsillie. He's the guy who makes things happen. He also, and, the, and this, you know, the, this is not coming from his mouth. This is coming from the mouths of the people who sit around the table. He has enormous respect because, he, you know, the, our government civil servants, uh, especially in this case, have done a superb job. But there, there's always the problem of getting departments, agencies to work together. He found a way to make that happen. 
And they, anyone I've asked around that table agrees that without him, um, they probably wouldn't have the harmony that they have. Now, uh, Jim Bosley has also created the Arctic Research Foundation, which funds a boat called the Bergman, which is named, of course, after Marty, um, which is a key platform in this search because when, when government people went to him and said, look, we, we have a serious problem early on in this search effort, uh, and he said, well, well, what do you need? They said, what we really need is a boat because they were using the icebreaker, um, and the icebreaker has other things to do. They have to pick up navigation aids and repair them. They have to rescue Inuit hunters who are caught in storms, etc. So when the search effort was going on in these, you know, 2008, 9, 10, etc., they couldn't devote all of their time to searching for these ships. It was always a matter of, well, if, if we have a few hours, we can do it. Otherwise, we have to do our other duties. So Balsali said, okay, I'll, I'll get you a boat. He spent his own money. I, you know, you got to buy the book to find out how much. Um, but he's in this game for a sizable amount of money. And that boat, the Bergman, didn't find Erebus, but what it did was almost as important. It found out where it wasn't. And the experts tell me, you know, the, you have to imagine how monotonous and time-consuming this effort is. Something like 10% of the Canadian Arctic seabed is mapped to modern standards. 10%. So 90% is anything from, from the old method of you know, dropping a line with a lead weight on the bottom to sound it to various stages in between. Because the standard of charting is so poor, the icebreaker, for instance, cannot go into the, easily into the northern area where the two ships were abandoned. Um, they, they have a rule that a smaller boat which is launched from the icebreaker, of course, can go into those shallower waters, but it can't be uh, uh, more than a certain distance away from the icebreaker because if you fall in the water, you have four minutes to survive. They have to get a helicopter there or something to rescue you. So you can imagine the logistical problems. Step one, therefore, is to chart properly that seabed. So here's how they do it. They launch a few small craft with these sonars, and they do search rows up and back, up and back, with a sonar behind it. And you can, you know, that's a vast, it's a vast area to, to is an understatement. But it is hours upon hours, days upon days, weeks upon weeks of doing nothing but staring at a computer screen in search lanes. First to chart and also to see if you see any sign of Erebus or terror down there. Now, Bergman, the, the Bergman, uh, the Arctic Research Foundation ship, has done most of that charting. And so it was valuable in showing where the ship wasn't. Now, the, the day that they actually found um, Ar what came to be known as Erebus, the Hydrography Agency, the Canadian Hydrographic Service, which is the service that makes navigation charts, owned time that day on, a, on the Coast Guard helicopter, which is based on the icebreaker. So it decides who gets on that helicopter and where the helicopter goes. But the guy who is the chief hydrographer, a guy named Scott Youngblood, it's a very nice guy, very cooperative, said to two land-based archaeologists, a guy named Doug Stenton and Robert Park. Robert Park's at the University of Waterloo. Doug Stenton is the head of uh, heritage for the government of Nunavut. Both also fine gentlemen. Um, so they went up in the helicopter, and it was in flight that they, you know, Scott Youngblood he, uh, said to the others, his mission was to post a beacon on one of many hundreds of islands in the, uh, you know, in the area that they were flying over. Um, 
And it didn't really matter to him which of those islands in a particular area anyone would do. So he said over the, the you know, microphone, um, you know, any of those islands down there, if you like it, you pick it. So the archaeologist said, how about that one? And Andrew Sterling, the helicopter pilot, landed, and they got out, and the archaeologists were searching, and Scott was putting up his navigation beacon. The pilot, Andrew Sterling, um, as he always does, walked the shoreline with a shotgun looking for polar bears to make sure that the guys were safe. His father taught him amateur archaeology, uh, and that's how he developed an interest in it. The archaeologists who he had worked with over several summers taught him how to look for artifacts in the Arctic. So it was sort of a hobby. He could have just sat, as some helicopter pilots do, I'm told, just sit in the helicopter. He could have read a book, but he walked the shore looking for artifacts. He's the one who found the iron davit next to a rock, and if, if you see a photograph of it, it sent chills up my spine, because the sea is here, the rock is up the shoreline here, and the iron davit, which is about, you know, yay, yay big, if I got that right, and it's sort of a hairpin shape, it was flush against the rock on the other side of the sea. Now, there's any number of ways an object that heavy can get behind a rock when the thing that it came from was over there. It could have come in the ice, who knows? When I look at it, it looks like somebody put it there. Now, that could have been a hunter, it could have, they're just, you can use your imagination, it could have been put there. Um, when Andrew Sterling saw it, he thought, well, that doesn't belong there, and he was taught, don't touch it, and he called the archaeologists over, and even the experts looked at it and thought, nah, that doesn't, that looks modern to me. But turned over, it had the broad arrow on the bottom of it. Now, the broad arrow, I've learned, is something that the Royal Navy stamped on anything that was part of anything that was Royal Navy, because thieves used to break in to the dockyards and steal stuff. And when the cops came and they found the broad arrow on it, they knew that was Royal Navy property. So sure enough, that's the clue that said one of Franklin's vessels was somewhere around there. Now at that point, you know, this is no slur against the Parks Canada team because they are brilliant people. But at that point, I think I could have found Erebus because you knew exactly where to look. Now, um, Louis Kamokak, who I'm sure you know, many people here have heard or read about, um, could have told you where to look too. He's an Anuk historian, uh, lives in Joe Haven. He's, he's an extraordinary human being with an extraordinary life story. He was born on the tundra. His, uh, you know, to make a long story short, his great-grandmother, is a, you know, was a highly respected storyteller, which means she's an oral historian herself. Um, one summer, when they were out on the land hunting, uh, she was ill, so Louis's parents, uh, he was about seven, I think, at the time, Louis's parents said, you take care of your great-grandmother while we go off following the caribou and such. So he did that, and he described in great detail, me, d detail to me on this last trip, um, being in a tent at night with a, a soapstone lamp with, uh, you know, seal, oil, flame, listening to his great-grandmother tell stories as he would go to sleep. And she sto told stories of the white men and her encounters with them and other others in the communities, and, you know, the, the, the hunting communities' encounters with them. And at the time, he didn't know Louis, um, who these people were, simply that they were foreigners, uh, and they were frightening. Because the description of them, you know, you can imagine, as we know now, they had scurvy, and they had lead poisoning, and 
Um, they weren't dressed very well for the, for the freezing cold, so they were in pretty bad shape when, whenever they encountered local people. So the stories of them uh, to a boy of seven years old were, were quite frightening. He kept them in his head, um, and when one day his parents were quite far away from the camp, and he was alone with his great-grandmother and great-grandfather, a plane landed. And, you know, th this is a common story you hear in the north. Uh, out comes a teacher, a nurse, an interpreter, and the pilot. And they said to Louis and his sister, you're coming with us. He wasn't allowed to say goodbye to his parents. It was time to go to school. So the plane takes off, it takes him uh, to, uh, to um, a community, and he, he, he goes to school. It was in class that he started to hear the history of Franklin. And a switch went off, and he thought, well, maybe it has something to do with the stories my great-grandmother told me. And so he spent 30 years gathering oral history of people from four different, uh, what are effectively clans, all of which hunted in areas of King William Island, but they come from different directions. And he started to build family trees, and he had a pretty good understanding of, of the, the stories they told and, and you know, could cross-reference and that sort of thing, but he was missing an important piece, which was the white man's history. Now here's another serendipitous moment. The, there is a guy, an antiquarian bookseller from Calgary, who is with a British adventurer and they're trying to find Franklin's ship. The British adventurer gets ill, they have to hit the panic button on their GPS, a helicopter comes, picks them up, drops them off in Joe Haven, they explain what it is they're up there doing, and someone says, oh, you should go talk to Louis. So they go and talk to Louis. The Calgary antiquarian bookseller is so intrigued by Louis, he says, you know, I'm going to send you some books that might help you. He sends him a first edition of Franklin's second overland journey. He sends him a couple of others for free. Louis starts reading these, and he's got the whole thing figured out. Because as you'll know, and I'm going to wrap this up, as you'll know, there's a famous map which was drawn by, uh, by Nanook, um, who had been interviewed uh, both by Charles Francis Hall, the American searcher, and I think it was John Ray before him, if I remember it right. And no one could figure out where, what, what that island on the map was. Well, Louis could figure it out because he knew the family tree, he knew the hunting area for that clan, and he knew it has to be in that area. And the only island that looks like that is where they found Erebus. Now, all of this leads to a final point. You know, if, if there are spirits or something driving this, well, why now? The hopes of the people of Joe Haven, and this is happening as we speak, are that this will be a transformation for their community. There's, there's nothing up there, there's no mines, there are, there's nothing other than their traditional hunting, fishing for subsistence and working in schools or others for the government. The hope is that, and, and no one knows if this is going to happen because it's in discussion stage, Parks Canada has suggested that perhaps a national park could be created there. And that the people of Joe Haven could be trained both to guide visitors through to the sites, and there are many of them, both on land and now in the sea, and also to protect them. And this is the biggest risk. I can tell you that the cruise ships are booking up fast. There is something like seven, uh, I think at last count, that are eager to converge on Joe Haven and to the site where Erebus is, and tourists come ashore in their boats, and, and the various artifacts of, of the survivors and their different campsites along the shore of King William Island and elsewhere are all lying on the surface. You can go up there and find spoons and buttons and other things, and without people to watch, they can simply be picked up and taken away, and we lose more of this essential history. 
So on that hopeful note, I will say that quite possibly this is going to be not a great moment just for the people of Joe Haven, but also for this country, that we will have a new national park perhaps, and perhaps some of you will be able to kayak and to visit in, a, in an organized, eco-friendly manner that's, that's good for, for all of us and to experience this fabulous history. Thank you so much.